I am Andy Greenberg. I'm a writer for Wired magazine, and I've written a book called The Sandworm that you guys should all have a copy of. Um, and I tried in this book to tell what I think are some of the most important and impactful stories in the history of cybersecurity, but also what I would say uh, is the first true story of cyber war. Um, I wanted to start by showing you guys this video. This, you guys will all recognize, is an HMI. It's inside of a Ukrainian electric utility in western Ukraine. And you can see that the cursor on the screen here is trying to access circuit breakers and open them. Uh, and this was filmed by an operator in the facility, which was called Prikarpatia Oblonergo. And he, he pulls his iPhone back here as he's filming this and shows that, in fact, no one, he's not touching the mouse, no one is touching the computer at all, and yet the cursor continues to move. Uh, and he's asking here, uh, who is doing this? Who is trying to open these circuit breakers? This was shot in the midst of the very first blackout ever triggered by hackers uh, that affected a quarter million Ukrainians in December of 2015. And I don't speak Ukrainian, but I'm told that what he was asking in the audio of that clip is, who is doing this? Is this our IT staff remoting into this machine? And you know, who is behind this phantom mouse attack? That is the question that I would spend the next two years myself trying to answer. In late 2016, editors at Wired uh, asked me to find the big story of cyber war, and I uh, think that they had on their mind the attacks on the U U.S. Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign, which I didn't see as cyber war attacks at all. I didn't know if I even believed that cyber war was a real phenomenon. Uh, and I started to look for what I consider to be a, a real cyber war, a sustained series of disruptive attacks by a nation state against even a military adversary, to be, I guess, very strict about the definition. And I, I began to see, reading in my colleague Kim Zetter's work, she had left Wired at that point, and in talking to analysts, that this was, this was starting to happen in Ukraine. That in early 2014, after this pro-Western revolution uh, came in Ukraine, Russia had promptly invaded the country, and this physical invasion had been accompanied by wave after wave of digital attack on every strata of Ukrainian society, I began to learn. And that had included the media, the private industry, uh, every government agency, and ultimately its utilities, culminating in that first blackout attack, the video that I just showed you. And when I looked into the mechanics of that first blackout, this is from the SANS Institute, it was shocking to me, not just in the kind of unprecedented nature, the brazenness of having actually turned off the power, but in the mechanics, the blow-by-blow -blow of this attack. The, they had started, these unknown hackers, uh, with the usual stuff, like uh, phishing emails with the malicious Word documents that had planted this Trojan black energy that they used to steal credentials to get access to the VPN. But then they had accessed the Citrix remote desktop um, tool that Prikarpatia Oblenergo used. Uh, they had used this phantom mouse attack. They'd remoted into the machines, taken control of the mouse, locked out the, the operators, and forced them to watch as they manually clicked through their circuit breakers. And then they, is really when they began to show off. They rewrote the firmware of the serial to ethernet converters and the distribution stations of this utility so that they, the, the operators were locked out. They couldn't turn the power back on. They uh, used kill disk to wipe all of the machines in the facility, uh, this data destructive wiper. They tampered with the uninterruptible power supply so that the operators themselves were thrown into a blackout in the midst of their blackout. And then, in this kind of last insult to injury, they bombarded the facility with fake phone calls in a kind of telephonic DDoS attack. I was just kind of blown away by the, the cruelty, the relentless, and I, I thought kind of uniquely aggressive 
series of mechanics of this attack that I had seen. And I was at this point ready to jump into the story. I felt like I was kind of late, uh, but then it happened again. There was another blackout in late 2016, this time in the capital of Kiev. And now I could see that there was this, an ongoing cyber war in Ukraine, and in fact, an escalating one. Uh, and I was determined to figure out who uh, was responsible. I, I mean, that, that was the question that was already on my mind. Who were these kind of fascinating and cruel hackers that had pulled off these back-to-back uh, -back annual attacks? So I spoke to FireEye, who had acquired this little company, iSight Partners, that in 2014 had first identified this group of hackers called Sandworm. And Sandworm was named because they, their installations of black energy, each one had a little campaign code to identify the victim, and they were each a reference to the sci-fi novel Dune. Uh, and iSight Partners had found that Sandworm, on its command and control server for one of these black energy installations, had a Russian language how-to file to explain how to use black energy in an open directory. So we knew these guys were Frank Herbert fans. We knew they seemed to be Russian, the Russians, Russian speaking at least. Uh, and they had fairly typical Russian victims, mostly kind of typical espionage targets in NATO and uh, Eastern Europe. But then the US Department of Homeland Security released, re revealed in fact that Sandrum had some atypical targets as well. They were also inside of American utilities and they had successfully planted black energy in multiple U.S. facilities. At this point, I felt like I was seeing something that I was surprised that hadn't been discussed more, that the same hackers who crossed the line for the first time in 2015 and then again in 2016 and turned off the power to civilians, something no one has ever publicly um, you know, been confirmed to have done elsewhere, these same hackers had planted their malware in the American grid just a year before. So this was now a story that I felt like I could tell to Americans and that, that was immediately analogous to our domestic national security and that of the West. Uh, and I felt, because I was sort of late to the story, like I wanted to tell it in a different way, not the kind of mechanics and the, the technical details of the of this cyber war. And, and this is not a technical talk. You guys are my technical sources. Um, I want to tell human stories. And I, in this story, I wanted to tell it the way that I read good war journalism that captures the experience of the people involved, the defenders and the victims. And so I went to Ukraine and I met almost immediately with Alexei Yasinski, who had been the chief information security officer at Starlight Media, the biggest TV broadcaster in Ukraine. Starlight Media had been hit with one of the first attacks in that very first 2015 wave of, of uh, black energy and kill disk, this wiper attacks, an, an attack that intended to destroy their network, essentially. He had done the incident response on that attack, then taken his knowledge, gone to the small firm information system security partners, and made it the kind of go-to incident response shop for wave after wave of Ukrainian uh, cyber war uh, targeting. And then that culminated in 26, late 2016 for him when in that second blackout attack the power was turned out to his own home. He w had been watching a film at home with his family in their apartment in northern Kiev when the power was turned out. And he felt like these hackers that he had been tracking for a year at that point had reached out from the kind of technical space of his work into his personal, the personal space of his family and his home. And it deeply affected him. It was exactly the kind of story of the experience of cyber war I wanted to capture. Uh, and I really appreciate this particular thing about Ukrainians, that unlike practically anyone else in the world, when you ask them about being the victim of a cyber attack, if it's Russia at least, they tell you everything. They are completely open uh, in a way that I have very rarely experienced. And I, when I visited the operators in the Western Ukrainian facility, um, who had been hit with that first blackout. They told me every step of this humiliating, relentless attack. They airdropped, they airdropped that video from their iPhone to mine with no hesitation. And then I visited the northern Kiev transmission station that had been the target of that second blackout attack. And I spoke to this guy, Oleg Zaychenko, uh, who was sitting here on, 
the a night a week before Christmas in 2016, uh, just before midnight, he was on duty at this desk when uh, he heard an alarm go off above his head, and he turned to his right and he saw on the control panel that uh, a circuit breaker had switched from red to green. The light had turned from red to green, signaling that uh, it had been opened. And as he picked up the phone to call his supervisor, he watched rapid fire as every other light on the control panel turned from red to green. All the circuit breakers had been opened in this transmission station, uh, turning off the power to a large fraction of the capital of the country. Ukrainergo, the national utility that experienced this, couldn't tell me the details of that attack at the time. Uh, and they did say that it seemed to be an automated attack, that it wasn't the same sort of phantom mouse manual, literally manual attack that, they, that Ukraine had seen the year before. We didn't really know what that meant until months later when ESET, the Slovakian cybersecurity company, revealed that that, that Ukrainergo attack had been carried out with a unique piece of malware uh, called Indestroyer. And Indestroyer was, as you guys probably are familiar with, the only the second piece of malware since Stuxnet that could directly interact with, with industrial control, control system equipment. And it was designed to send these kind of machine gun-like commands, speaking any of four protocols, uh, to, turn, to open those circuit breakers faster than any human could respond. At the time, this was a strange sort of puzzle, because why would these hackers be uh, in their second attack, which took them months to plan, they built this custom piece of malware, doing something that had rarely ever been seen before, just to cause a one-hour blackout, because that's how long the power was down in Kiev before the operators managed to turn it back on manually. And that mystery was only solved in recent months by uh, Dragos. Joe Slowick, the analyst at Dragos, um, put together a kind of new order of operations of that attack, reconstructing it, and showed that turning off the power uh, within Destroyer was actually only the first step, that the next step was to wipe all of the machines in Ukrainergo's facility. And then they would use this little understood, we knew that there was a part of the Destroyer attack that attacked protective relays. But when that was first revealed, it wasn't really clear how it would be used. And Joe um, made sense of this idea that what actually was intended was that after these first two steps, then the hackers would, would use this DOS, this attack that puts to sleep the protective relays in the facility. And in doing so, they would trick the operators into scrambling to turn the power back on, and in doing so, potentially cause a surge and overload of current on some piece of equipment that could uh, you know, damage equipment, maybe even harm staff, destroy a transformer, and it was this insidious move to use the operator's response against them. Uh, I didn't know that theory when I was first exploring this in 2017, but what I could see was that there was an escalating series of uh, increasingly disruptive, brazen, and innovative cyber attacks hitting Ukraine um, that seemed to all be linked. And I wrote this story for Wired. This was the first piece that I really did about this sandworm story. And I tried to capture a theme in this story that um, Ukraine, it seemed, was being used as a, a test lab for Russia's cyber war attacks. And that meant that we should not ignore what was happening there. It, Ukraine was not only a canary in the coal mine and you know, victims of these unpre un unprecedented attacks, but uh, for our own national security, we needed to pay attention that what happened in Ukraine, I wrote, would sooner or later spread to the rest of the world. When you make a prediction like that, you don't actually want it to come true the week or the day that you publish it. Uh, but that, unfortunately, is what happens. The very day that the story hit newsstands, not Petya, uh, spread around the world, June 27, 2017. And it looked like this, of course. This was the screen that appeared on countless thousands of machines around the world. Um, and it looked like ransomware, uh, you know, uh, demanding $300 in Bitcoin to decrypt uh, a computer. I was totally hooked by this. This is me getting the story wrong on the day the NotPetya hit, thinking, despite the fact that I'd been, you know, covering for months, deeply investigating this Ukrainian cyber war, that this was somehow disconnected, that this was somehow now just an act of cyber crime. Um, and I think that it, 
it shows that in the moment these deceptive attacks can actually work. Um, but when I spoke to Ukrainians, to their credit, they immediately recognized this for what it was and told me that paying the ransom was not working, that it wasn't really ransomware. ISSP and Alexei Yasinski told me on that first day that this was a massive coordinated cyber invasion. Uh, and I, you know, so I, this is me on the second day, finally getting the story right. Um, but it would only be days later that ESET, again, would show who was behind this. And ESET assembled this timeline. They had been tracking the data disrupt disruptive attacks in, in Ukraine in late 2016, and they showed that those attacks shared, uh, shared tools with uh, a fake ransomware attack in March of 2017, which in turn uh, shared other components with a kind of dry run for NotPetya in May of 2017, X data that, like NotPetya, would be seeded out with this, with this uh, malicious update to, to Ukrainian accounting software, which was then you know, uh, followed by NotPetya a month later. So ESET immediately pieced together these interlocked fingerprints that carried the story all the way from NotPetya in June of, 27, of, June of 2017 back to those data destructive attacks in 2016 and ultimately back to the 2015 attacks that Sandworm had first carried out. It also became clear that this prediction that I had made unknowingly to me was coming true already. And this was spreading out to the rest of the world. It was, this was a worm that did not respect Ukraine's borders. And we began to see the, the kind of uh, mind-blowing numbers reported by these public companies as they told their shareholders what they were experiencing. And I was shocked by this. $300 million from Maersk, the world's biggest shipping firm, $400 million from FedEx, ultimately $870 million from Merck, alone, the New Jersey pharmaceutical company. Um, and at this point, I felt like I was going a little nuts because I had watched this apparently you know, Russian uh, series of attacks escalate. I could kind of understand how the world was willing to ignore these attacks when they were just hitting Ukraine, that that was considered Russia's sphere of influence. Russia had already paid the price for invading Ukraine. It had been sanctions for that physical invasion, and it could get away with what, whatever it wanted digitally, I think. We had all, um, I mean, at least the world's governments seemed to have agreed. But this had now spilled out to the West. These were multinational companies, and yet no one was calling out Russia, despite ESET's evidence. Uh, none of these companies were naming Russia as the culprit of this attack that was just covering their balance sheets in blood. I, um, I felt like I was being gaslighted almost, that I could see what was happening and yet um, no one was talking about this. So I went back to the place where I knew that people would talk about it, which is Ukraine. And I did another story, another kind of um, reporting trip where this was almost like a whirlwind oral history of NotPetya's carpet bombing of Ukraine. And this is the Minister of Infrastructure in Ukraine, Volodymyr Melyan, who um, told me that, in frank terms, NotPetya had just destroyed their government, that the government was dead uh, on, on that first day and for days to come. Um, and he described it as a massive bombing of all their systems. This is Igor Smelyansky, who runs the Postal Service in Ukraine. And he described to me the decision that he had to make to turn off the Postal Service, essentially, turn off the network for the entire country's Postal Service, which in Ukraine includes not just mail, but uh, newspaper delivery, uh, payment systems, uh, the payment of pensions to Ukrainian retirees. It's a critical service of the, of the nation. And I spoke to this guy, Pavlo, Pavlo Bondarenko, who was an IT administrator at the Ministry of Health. And Pavlo made the call, he suggested to the health minister very early in the day that they turn off the network. And in doing so probably saves a lot of the health data of the country. Um, but as he was leaving the office that evening, after this chaotic day, he tried to get on the metro to go home and he found that he couldn't actually uh, swipe his credit card to get onto the Kiev metro, that, it, that that system was broken by NotPetya. So he went out to find an ATM to get some cash and found that all the ATMs in his neighborhood, in this neighborhood around his office, were down. He finally found one that had a very small cash limit and this long line of people as if it were still Soviet times. And then he 
uh, managed to get some cash, get a physical token, get on the metro, go to his home neighborhood, uh, and get off, and he tried to go grocery shopping, found that the payment system was down in his grocery store, went out to find more cash. In this neighborhood, too, all the ATMs were down, and this kind of went on and on for him, and he felt, as he described it to me, like he had found himself in this end-of-the-world movie, and that it was physically disorient disorientating to him, that he, he described it to me that, that he felt like he was missing a limb, uh, that things had just stopped working. Uh, and it had gone very quickly from, you know, uh, I can't see what's new on Facebook, to will I be able to get enough milk and bread to last a week? And I spoke also to this woman, um, Olesia Linick, and this is her father. Uh, and they together um, created Linkos Group, the accounting software company that sells Medoc, which had been the vehicle that these hackers had used um, to piggyback their NotPetya infections, to seed it out to thousands of victim networks around the world. Really anyone who, who not only um, paid taxes in Ukraine, but anyone who did business in Ukraine was affected by this. And um, uh, her company, which she had built really almost from scratch and inherited from her father um, this, this part of the business, was, had its reputation essentially destroyed by this. Um, and worse, uh, a week later, the Ukrainian police arrives. They jumped out of vans and raided the building. They ran up the stairs carrying these semi-automatic rifles, pointing them at staff, um, kicking open locked doors. Uh, and they took the update server, put it in a plastic bag, as if like this was bin Laden's compound and this was somehow the solution to the attack that the country had faced. And this struck me as like kind of sad and funny, but also a, an illustration of the ways that we sort of misunderstand the geography of cyber war. Like they had traced this attack and it was inside the country, but of course it wasn't. It was performed by attackers somewhere hundreds of miles away across this uh, network that defies that geography entirely. Um, as I was learning about all of this in Ukraine, I was finally, I had been sort of banging my head against the wall as a reporter trying to find any multinational company that would share their experience, that would explain how the hell did you guys lose hundreds of millions of dollars to this worm. Uh, and I finally, thanks to some brave sources, uh, was able to recreate, to piece together that story for Maersk, the world's largest shipping conglomerate. Maersk had one office on the Black Sea coast of Ukraine in Odessa with one copy of Medoc, this accounting software installed. And that was enough for their entire global network to be devastated by NotPetya. Uh, this is the headquarters of Maersk in Copenhagen. They never actually let me inside. This is just a photo I took from the outside. And in this building, this kind of iconic blue tinted uh, windowed building on the Copenhagen Harbor, um, Staff began to see on this afternoon of June 27, 2017, that every screen on every computer in the building was going dark. Uh, one staffer described to me, like looking up and watching as a wave of blackness hits every screen that he could see, just black, 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 black. And then as they rebooted, they would show the ransomware message. And soon they began to realize the scale of this crisis and uh, IT administrators were running down hallways and um, they were actually jumping over the, the turnstiles between parts of the building because those were paralyzed by this infection too. They were screaming at people to turn off computers, running into meeting rooms and unplugging machines as, the, as this worm unfolded, just trying to preserve anything that they could before it was infected. But uh, as, we, as we've heard, I think, in this conference and as we're learning, um, an attack on IT systems uh, in a company that has physical machinery can have physical effects, even without a kind of ICS component. And that's what we saw immediately with Maersk. This is the Elizabeth, New Jersey uh, terminal for EPM terminals, the Maersk-owned port business, essentially. And Maersk owns 76 of these terminals around the world. Uh, this one is the size of a full square mile it's in the New Jersey Harbor. I chose, it, I chose to focus on it really because I can see it from my office window in uh, Manhattan. Uh, 
And ships the size of the Empire State Building arrive at this sort of terminal, carrying another Empire State Building's worth of cargo on top of them. And on that day, suddenly no one could figure out what was on these ships. They had no inventory systems. Uh, they had no way of understanding how to perform this gargantuan Jenga game of unloading these ships and figuring out where to put the stuff. But the real choke point, it turned out, was the gates outside of this terminal, uh, which used a voice over IP system to tell truck drivers as they pulled up, uh, this is where you should go and to drop something off or pick it up. It was this kind of like a check-in system at an airline, and that was down. Uh, the gate was dead. There was no communication to the drivers. Maersk could not even send them an email. So these trucks in, at this terminal began to line up in a line that was hundreds of trucks long, stretching for miles. And then they were told by port police, you have to leave, you have to find somewhere else to send your stuff. And many of these containers you know, carried components of just-in-time supply chains and retail goods and uh, perishable things that had to be refrigerated. And all of this uh, fell on the drivers to figure out. And they had to send things at a premium or find some storage facility. And they, they had not even heard anything from Maersk about what was happening. And this was unfolding not just in Elizabeth, New Jersey, of course, but at 17 of Maersk terminals around the world. You have to, you have to multiply that picture 17 fold. And Maersk very quickly uh, realized that this was a, an existential threat to their company. They set up this building in, outside of London as their um, recovery operation center. They took over the building, uh, pushed everybody out who wasn't doing uh, recovery, flew in everybody who even vaguely had anything to do with IT and the whole global business, um, brought in uh, Deloitte, paid them millions and millions of dollars to just throw anything they could at this, solving this problem. People were sleeping in hallways and under desks uh, for days. But the very first problem that they encountered was that they didn't actually have a backup of their domain controllers. And this, as you guys know, is like the the first piece of recovering the backbone of your network. They couldn't really even get started building, rebuilding their network without it. And what had happened is that Maersk has more than 100 domain controllers around the world, but each of them is set to back up to each other in this redundancy system. And they hadn't planned for a situation where absolutely every domain controller is wiped at the same time, which is exactly what happens with NotPetya. And so they began frantically calling every data center they had in the world until they finally uh, kind of miraculously found one uh, working domain controller in a data center in Ghana. And uh, this was like a moment of joy, but they, they still had to somehow get that back up back to Maidenhead. So they tried to set up the secure connection from Ghana to their Maidenhead operation, but the bandwidth was too low, was too thin at the Ghanaian data center. So they tried to fly the Ghanaians to London, but the Ghanaians didn't have the right visa. So they had to set up this relay race where they flew the Ghanaians to Nigeria and then they, the people from London flew to Nigeria and they did this um, handoff in the airport of a physical hard drive that they flew back to London and drove to Maidenhead to begin the long process of rebuilding this network which still took weeks uh, to, and ultimately months to return to a full state of normalcy. Rebuilding 45,000 PCs, 7,000 servers. And again, this is multiplied by every uh, one of those multinational companies that was affected. Rankin Benkisler, the, the manufacturer that makes Durex condoms and Tylenol, and Mondelez, that, which owns the Nabisco and Cadbury, and Merck, uh, which makes life-saving drugs. All of these companies face the same, or even in some cases, greater fiascos. The total cost of Napetia was $10 billion. Um, I eventually learned from a White House, U.S. White House assessment. And when I spoke to the uh, most senior cybersecurity official in the White House, Tom Bossert, um, he confirmed that this was actually just a floor. This was not a ceiling. This was the minimum assessment of how much NotPetya had cost. Uh, but even then, this number does not actually capture the full toll of NotPetya because this is something that's little, only rarely discussed, but NotPetya hit hospitals too. This is a message um, that a woman in Pennsylvania posted to her Facebook account um, as 
she got out of the hospital on June 27, 2017 for, after gallbladder surgery. And as she says here, Europe or somewhere in that vicinity uh, hacked into her hospital and shut down all the computer systems. She, of course, didn't really know what was happening, but she heard the announcement in the hospital that um, IT staff needed to uh, report to some operation center to figure this out. And she watched as the people around her had their surgeries delayed or canceled. She luckily got to go ahead with hers. Uh, this was pretty rare. Only a couple of hospitals were directly infected with NotPetya, but much more common was that hospitals in the US at least were affected by a secondary effect of the outage of this company, Nuance, which makes speech to text software. Nuance was themselves terribly hit by NotPetya. They lost $100 million. But the real cost of Nuance's outage was felt by its customers, which included, uh, for instance, Sutter, Sutter Health, a network of uh, about 24 hospitals across the US. And Sutter, like many of uh, probably hundreds of US hospitals, uses Nuance for transcribing automatically changes to medical records. Uh, a doctor can pick up the phone and call this line and read into the, to Nuance's software changes to medical records that are automatically made. And uh, on the day that not that you hit. I talked to Jackie, I didn't speak to her on this day, but I later talked to Jackie Monson, uh, the, the chief information security officer of, of Sutter, and she told me that she had initially been relieved to see that their hospitals were spared. She thought by not, they hadn't been infected with NotPetya directly. Um, unfortunately, she began to learn within 24 hours that they faced a less obvious problem. They used nuance. And within 24 hours, they had a backlog of more than a million changes to medical records that had been lost. This was a silent failure. So what that looked like um, for a hospital, I spoke with a, uh, an IT staffer at a major US hospital who asked me not to name her, uh, who a couple of days after NotPetya had been approached by this panicked nurse who was telling her, uh, I have a child patient who is scheduled to be transferred to another hospital for a critical procedure. And we don't know if this child is cleared for surgery because uh, his or her medical record hasn't been updated. We've lost the change to that record. So the IT staffer had to go through all of the raw audio of the doctor's recordings to find the one that was missing, um, put it, basically update that medical record. They managed to do this just in time for the child to have this procedure on time. And then that happened two more times to this one staffer within a week. Again, other children who were due to be transferred and they just barely caught these changes in time. I you know, don't know of a case where someone's health was directly impacted by NotPetya, but if you uh, multiply this, and I should mention that Jackie Monson, the Chief Information Security Officer at Sutter, told me that at, at, one, at one point she was on a conference call um, with victims of this Nuance attack that had hundreds of people on the call, all trying to get information from Nuance about their outage. So if you multiply this by the hundreds or thousands of patients in each of these hospitals, and the dozens or maybe hundreds of hospitals that were affected by this in the US, it's very difficult to say that no one's health or life was affected by NotPetya. And I, you know, I think we all dread the moment when there is a confirmed loss of life from a cyber attack. But it may be, in fact, that NotPetya was that cyber attack and that its own, its scale actually hid that fact from us. In February of 2018, the White House released this statement, uh, finally saying, this is maybe the shortest statement I've ever seen from a US government agency. Um, and it said simply, NotPetya was the work of the Russian military. It was the worst cyber attack in history, and there will be consequences. And this was backed up by similar statements from all of the other four Five I countries, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, all naming Russia. Uh, a month later, the US did impose new sanctions on Russia for NotPetya. So in some ways, uh, it was like, finally, um, this you know, reality has caught up with uh, my understanding of, of the facts that Russia is being held accountable. Um, but in fact, six days before this message was posted, another attack had, had struck. Uh, 
and that was Olympic Destroyer. Uh, I heard the details of this attack from this man on the far left, Sung Jin Oh. He's the he was the IT director for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games, and on the night of February 9th, 2018, he was sitting in this chair in the Pyeongchang Olympic Stadium, uh, ready to watch what he thought would be a kind of highlight of his career unfold, because for three years he'd been building the IT back end of the Olympics. Uh, and just at 8 p.m. as the ceremony began, um, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, he looked down at his phone and saw a series of messages saying that all the domain controllers in his data center were being destroyed. So he ran out of the stadium, uh, grabbed his staff, they jumped in a car, drove to a network operations center nearby, and uh, desperately worked to rebuild the basic systems of the Olympics, which included you know, Wi-Fi, the Olympic app, the security systems that allowed people to badge in and out of this, this event, because uh, in, in less than an hour, the ceremony would be over, and all 35,000 people would leave, including heads of states and foreign dignitaries, and there would be this confusion as people tried to figure out you know, where they were going or what hotel they were staying at, and it would be this um, humiliating thing for a very wired country hosting the Olympics. They managed to bring those services back online just in time for the end of the ceremony, and then they spent the next 12 hours, that entire night, rebuilding the entire network of the games and isolating this piece of malware, purging it from the network that would come to be called Olympic Destroyer. Sang Jin Oh, despite this, I, I would say, incredibly traumatic event for him, would not even speculate to me about who was responsible for that cyber attack. Um, but for all of, all of you and the security community, it became this whodunits of um, who would dare to do this. And there were, you know, in this kind of mystery fashion, clue, there were motivations all around. North Korea attacks South Korea you know, for arbitrary things all the time. And Russia had been banned from these Olympic Games for doping. So uh, everyone seemed motivated to attack. But when, they, when analysts began to look at the code of Olympic Destroyer, they quickly found that there were clues that pointed not just to Russia, but also to North Korea. It matched, some parts of it matched a, a, a wiper tool used by Lazarus. Uh, called Blue Noroff, and then other components even matched Chinese hackers. This was not just a false flag attack, but layers of false flags wrapped you know, around this enigma. Uh, perhaps the most deceptive cyber attack in history, and one designed to throw doubt on the entire, um, the entire arena of reverse engineering. Ultimately, the, that mystery would only begin to be unraveled by um, an analyst at FireEye a couple weeks later, um, Michael Matonis, who looked not at the code of Olympic Des Destroyer, but at the lure document that had first planted it in, the, uh, in a phishing email sent to the International Olympic Committee. And he found um, traits that matched, uh, in fact, a tool that had been used to write a malicious script in that document that matched a collection of others, along with usernames in the metadata of these documents. Uh, and they included these which are a fake Ukrainian government document and a fake Kiev Pride March document, clearly targeted at Ukrainians. And North Koreans don't tend to be interested in Ukrainians. Um, but this you know, hinted at, hint of Russian involvement was not enough, of course. So Matonis began to look at the command and control servers of these, of these attacks, of the files, um, where they were collecting credentials, and he found, you know, from one domain, he checked the IP address, which hosted other domains, and he found this domain, accountlogonserve.com, which uh, to him immediately lit up like neon because he recognized this from a document he'd seen a year before uh, that the FBI had released, which was about the a kind of somewhat forgotten element of the Russian attacks on the U.S. electoral system. Uh, Russian hackers had penetrated the state boards of election of at least two states and accessed the information of hundreds of thousands of Americans. And the FBI was warning here that they were also, they were sending phishing emails that used this domain, accountlogonserve.com. Uh, Matonis had found in making this connection that not only did it seem that Olympic Destroyer was the work of Russia, but in fact, it was connected to the very same hackers who had 
been responsible for this most direct and intrusive element of the 2016 election hacking. Matonis went even further and wrote in a report about this that FireEye hasn't actually released, but they gave to me. He looked at the hosting providers of these documents and matched them with documents that matched not only uh, NotPetya, hosting providers rather, that matched the command and control of NotPetya, but also uh, earlier sandworm attacks in Ukraine. So FireEye would say with, with what they say is high confidence that this was the work of Russia, that uh, Olympic Destroyer is tied to Russia, which I think uh, has been now confirmed as well by um, anonymous officials speaking to the Washington Post, but also that all of these attacks were at least loosely tied together, perhaps to the same hackers or the same network of hackers, uh, from all the way from those first attacks in Ukraine and the blackouts to NotPetya to Olympic Destroyer. And just months later, the US Department of Justice would put out an indictment that named this guy, Anatoly Sergeyevich Kovalev, who is named in that indictment as having been responsible for the attacks on the state boards of election. Using a SQL injection attack, he, he accessed uh, a server of the state boards of election and with uh, half a million Americans' data. And that, of course, matches this entire nexus of attacks that Matonis had found uh, that connects back to Olympic Destroyer. And Kovalev was one of 12 agents of the GRU, Russia's military intelligence agency, named in that indictment. And he is part, the three guys highlighted here are part of uh, one unit within the GRU, unit 74455. And FireEye put together a theory, which I don't think is conclusive, but it's maybe the best that I have heard, that Sandworm is essentially unit 74455 of the GRU. If that's the case, then we also know where they're based because this indictment contains an address. And it's this building uh, known as the Tower in the north of Moscow. Uh, so in my kind of multi-year quest to figure out who the hell Sandworm is, I went there and I you know, felt like I had this mission to get as close as I could physically to these attackers. And I stood outside this building. I didn't have the guts to actually knock on the door and ask for an interview with Unit 74455. And this building is not marked as a GRU building, of course. Um, but this, of course, was like a, you know, we don't truly know that Sandworm is in this building. We don't truly know that, you, that Sandworm is 74455. You know, attribution is hard, but even more, even if they were, I felt this kind of futility that I felt almost like the Ukrainian police, like I was um, seeking out some sort of totem of the attack rather than the actual perpetrators as I did this. And ultimately, I, I do think that this story, despite the title of my book being Sandworm, is not really about the attackers. It's about the experience of the victims uh, and particularly the story and the history of Ukraine. Ukraine... Ukraine's name itself means borderland in, uh, in Ukrainian. And it has always been caught between the West and the East. It's been invaded by the Mongols and the Turks and the Tatars and, and the Nazis and then the Soviets. And you know, it was massacred in the Holocaust. It was starved in the Holodomor, the, the man-made famine that uh, the Soviets inflicted in the 1930s that killed millions of Ukrainians. It has always been a kind of victim of its geography. But in this case, this cyber war, we had thought that we could treat it like all of those foreign conflicts of the past, where we in the West just watch this, these tragedies unfold and treat it as someone else's problem. But Cyber war does not respect that geography. And of course, this, uh, these attacks had, for once in history, thus spilled out to bite us as well. We paid the price, a small part of the price at least, for our negligence, for the impunity that we gave to Russia to inflict these attacks. And I was reminded of something that Michael Hayden, the former NSA director, said at, at Black Hat, the Black Hat conference in 2010, uh, on the internet, we are all Poland. The inherent geography of this domain uh, is that everything plays to the offense. I think he was 
making a kind of more basic point that uh, it's easy to invade Poland and it's too easy to, to be the attacker um, on the internet. But there's another shade of this that maybe he intended or not. I, I think he was only in fact a hundred, few hundreds of miles off. On the internet, we are all Ukraine. We, in this realm that has no borders, we all live on the borderlands. And if we ignore the lessons of that borderland, then we will learn them ourselves through the pain of our own experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andy. Very interesting topic. Uh, and uh, you, have been, been, uh, you have agreed on, on actually sitting down a little while yeah, and, and answering a few more questions, not only the one from the audience. So um, if you please take a seat. Uh, I will start with uh, uh, talking to Andy a little about the book and uh, other topics. And then we will take the audience questions afterwards. Thank you. Water. Um, so, you're really digging into uh, interesting and, to some extent, sensitive topics here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. I thank you. I think the, um, the sensitive part you have to explain. But. Well, yes, of course. Uh, but I, I thought I'd start with uh, um, trying to figure out some kind of, um, for the NotPetya case, for example, uh, if there was, weren't, weren't any ransom uh, demanded in, the, in for real, could, could we ever find what the true intent of that attack was? Yeah, I have puzzled over this and I've heard different theories. I think that, I think you have to ask in part like what was the purpose of this entire series of disruptive attacks against Ukraine? Um, I've heard it described as experimentation, of course. I've heard it described as an influence operation that this was almost like terrorism, uh, a way to demoralize the populace, to make them feel um, that they couldn't trust their own government to keep them safe, uh, that Ukraine was a failed state. Um, and I think that there's a, a third, you, if you look at the kind of culture of the GRU as I have tried to learn about it, it seems like it's also a kind of cowboy macho culture of trying to outdo one another to just do every aggressive thing you can think of to impress your boss that day. So the question of like, what was the motivation of NotPetya, it, it, it's probably layers of all those things. But I have a feeling what you're actually asking is like, why, why, uh, why did it hit the West as well? Why did it hit all these yes. multinationals? Uh, that's a harder question. Um, clearly, the, the first theory is that that was all collateral damage and that included Russia, by the way. And I maybe failed to make that as clear as I should in the, in the talk, but um, Russia was terribly hit by NotPetya too, um, which implies that this was an accident, but it would be an incredibly reckless and foreseeable kind of accident because um, the Medoc software, this accounting software that was used to seed out NotPetya would have given the um, hackers access to a very specific piece of data, the um, tax identification number of all of the victims. So they, the hackers could have easily filtered, sorted through those numbers to find exactly the victims they wanted to. They could have hand-tailored um, and targeted this attack, mm -hmm. at least to keep it to Ukraine, and they didn't. They didn't even try to keep it out of Russia, from what I can tell. So um, I don't know, was, was that just negligence? Was that carelessness? or? Um, some people have said that that is wishful thinking, that they, um, I think Cisco Telos told me they believe that it was meant to be a kind of digital embargo against Ukraine. Like if you even trade with Ukraine, if you do business in Ukraine, you will be affected by this. But the fact that even Russian companies were hit still, you know, yeah. uh, is a, there's a, that's still a kind of um, incongruous element of that theory. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No. So yeah, it, it feels, um, like we may never know the, the true intent behind it, or if it was just, as you said, recklessness. Um, but uh, I mean, for, for many of the people in here, I hope, uh, we also, I mean, we have the, the responsibility of protecting our critical infrastructure to some extent. And 
And um, we have always wondered who will actually attack us, right? Because when you, when you operate something in a small part of the country, it's difficult to see that anyone would like to do anything with your specific plant or, or uh, business. So um, this, all this um, that you describe is very important to understand that there is a, a something big bad out there, but it's also difficult to really understand who it is. So, I mean, when it comes to attribution, mm -hmm. that is kind of a very complicated topic. So, what yeah. are your thoughts on yeah. that? No, I, I, I know that attribution is um, not only hard to do, but um, hard to talk about. Um, but I think to your points, like, um, there, are, for, there are some people for whom attribution maybe is not important, but that has, I think like the responders to an attack often, you know, you have bigger immediate problems than to figure out who is responsible. But I think that that's been confused in the industry or the, the security community beyond the industry. Um, I, in, it's become this mantra that attribution doesn't matter uh, or that we shouldn't try to do attribution. And for me as a journalist, as someone who is, to, you know, to be fair, not actually trying to solve um, the immediate problem of an attack, but to, uh, you know, journalists, journalism is about holding people accountable in many cases. And to do that, you have to do attribution. No matter how hard it may be, you can't just give up on it and say, like, it doesn't matter who did this or that. Um, you need to know who victims are, uh, telling that those stories matter, and you need to know who attackers are too. Um, as uncomfortable as that discussion can be, you know, that's the only way that we will be able to create norms to make red lines that people um, actually stop crossing is to hold them accountable when they do. Right. But, but it, so you believe it's possible to create some kind of international law regarding cyber war? Well, I, I, I do. Uh, well, I, I think that it makes sense to try. Um, I'm fully in support of uh, like Brad Smith at Microsoft when he says that we need a, a Geneva Convention for the internet. And then there's the separate question of can we actually pull that off? Can we actually get everyone to agree to something like that? Um, and that I'm not enough of a diplomat to know if that's possible. But it, it seems like the big hurdle um, is attribution. But that's maybe not the biggest hurdle. It seems like the bigger one is that uh, governments seem to just l love the feeling of these capabilities. Like the power of cyber attacks is this, you know, siren song that like uh, even more restrained Western governments don't want to give up. Like uh, the US, for instance, in this defend forward mantra that we were hearing lately, like um, it seems like cyber command in the US wants the ability to do these sorts of attacks themselves, even though they do them with much more restraint, uh, and they may not be ready. I hear that they are not ready to sign over that capability for some sort of Geneva Convention, even if it means restraining an adversary that's far more aggressive and reckless. Yeah. But it, it, um, I know that there have been attempts in trying to, to create some kind of international law, like the Tallinn Manual, for example. But it, it, for, for me, since, uh, as you say, uh, many countries and nations are actually establishing offensive capabilities the same way as uh, GRU, um, which makes it uh, scary when the talent manual, for example, have a section that says that if you uh, think that you have been damaged for, or with cyber means uh, and you, you can point fingers at someone, you, you are allowed to, to retaliate using conventional weapons. Right. Uh I mean, the talent manual, in my understanding, is like an interpretation of existing international law and applying it to, to, to cyberspace. Uh, is, um, I'm sorry, I cringe to even say the word cyberspace, excuse me. But, um, but <clears throat> that's not enough. You know, we need to go further. We need to, to think about this realm on its own terms mm -hmm. and uh, make rules that apply to the internet specifically and, and to these sorts of cyber attacks. I... Um, I don't, I mean, I, I never really want to see a day where we retaliate to cyber attacks with physical kinetic attacks. Um, but, you know, I do think that we need to create rules where there are consequences. I mean, it's amazing to see 
uh, what the GRU has done over just a few years, you know, from the election interference, which I, th which I think is, you know, has received an outsized response. There were so many um, sanctions and public statements about that and like a kind of message sent to Russia from the White House on this like secret post-nuclear phone line. Um, and that was like perhaps the, the least surprising and um, red line crossing thing that Russia has done compared to blackouts and NAPETIA and attacking the Olympics, all of which received either no response or a delayed kind of weak sauce response. So, um, you know, there, there do need to be consequences and those, but we have at our disposal things like sanctions mm -hmm. and indictments of hackers and just public statements. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we have barely seen public statements from the West about some of these attacks. Uh, so there are lots of tools before you like, you know, send a missile at the tower <laughs> yes. in Kiev. Fortunate sorry, in Moscow, rather. <laughs> yeah. And that's fortunate. But uh, so, so do you believe that if we start uh, to, when you do the attribution and we start to find out who is actually responsible, we can start using sanctions and embargoes and indictments and stuff like that to, to prevent them from actually being so aggressive, for example? Yeah, I, I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> like, it's, it's hard to know what's actually um, could restrain Putin or, you know, the generals trying to impress him. Um, but uh, it does seem like we have to try. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds, sounds, sounds fair. Um, well, then, uh, I'm, 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 thank you for, for answering my questions. Uh, now I'd like to, to take, bring sure. up a, yeah. a couple of the audience's questions. questions. Uh, and I think that some of them may be related to what we just talked about. So uh, please uh, bear with me. There's uh, someone here that uh, would like to know where you stand on the Mondolos versus Zurich Insurance Claim Act of oh, yeah. Disputes. Well, I love this because um, after, you know, all of these companies, um, sorry, just to make clear what you're asking about, you know, Mondelez um, filed for an insurance claim for their damages, I think, you know, almost $200 million from NotPetya, and they, their claim was rejected because their insurer um, I forget who it was, but their insurer said this was an act of war and we don't cover acts of war. Um, so to me, I was like, thank God somebody has actually officially said this is a cyber war. I'm not going crazy. Like uh, um, these companies that for, you know, even now, even after the all five Five Eyes have said that this was a Russian attack, uh, they're still not talking about Russia. You, know, you don't hear Maersk say, that Russia needs to be restrained because they did this damage to us or endangered the global order. So I was happy to see at least one private firm say, yes, this was an act of war. And like, uh, uh, and even if it was just to save themselves a few hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so but what, what will the implications be, do you think, uh, when, um, um, uh, from state attribution? What, will, what impact will that have on cyber insurances? Oh, on cyber insurance? Yes. Well, <clears throat> it's an interest, it's, it is interesting because it seems like um, attribution would be part of your uh, argument that it's an act of war. Like, acts of war don't come out of thin air. Like, they, they come from wars. So, mm -hmm. you would need to do attribution to do that. Um, so, maybe, I don't know, I haven't thought about this too much, but, I, but it could be that the insurance, cyber insurance industry will drive more attribution, <laughs> and we may see, you know, professional um, attributors or what, I don't know, um, to actually try to solve these mysteries, which I really welcome because, um, you know, it's not every incident responder's job to do attribution, but it needs to be somebody's job. And I, I think we don't want to leave it to just intelligence agencies either. They have the best tools to do it, but, um, but you know, we don't always trust the political motivations of governments. In many ways, we trust the financial motivations of companies more because they are honest in um, what you know in their motives. So yeah, I, I, it could be that um, lawyers will help us do this attribution as they argue over was this an act of war and who pulled it off. You know, that would be kind of nice. Right, but but uh, in my mind, it makes sense to I mean to to say that something is an act of war. You need to be able to establish some kind of 
rules of engagement or thing, and things that it's warlike, right? So right? I've declared right. war on you, so now we can t say that this is an act of war. Otherwise, if not, and there are no, no international law, it becomes more like terrorism. Yeah, so will there yeah. be some kind of semantic It's It's difficult to... Um, you know, even, the, even the physical invasion of Ukraine is an undeclared war. So the fact that NAPETIA, if you call it a part of that, um, it's not... Even, even tying it to the invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea does not make NAPETIA an act of war um, officially in that sense. I think uh, it probably helps that there has been a physical invasion. But I think that Mondelez's insurance um, is instead making the argument that this has all of the characteristics of an act of war. It's one nation state against another. Uh, it's, you know, uh, disruptive in its effects. It caused massive damage. Those are, I think, the, the attributes uh, and I haven't read the uh, legal arguments in that case, I have to be honest, but those are the arguments that I would say officially make NotPetya an act of war. There, wouldn't, there doesn't need to be a, a physical war for there, be, for there to be an act of cyber war, I, I don't think. Although we can argue about the definition of cyber war for the rest of the day. If probably, like. yeah. probably, yeah. So actually the next question is, is kind of related because they... Uh, wonder if the, 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 when we say cyber war, do we mean uh, do we refer to international law, or is it some de facto definition of a war, like uh, war on drugs? For example? Oh, God forbid! Um, I, I think I, I would I would say that uh, well, Richard Clark in his book Cyber War defined it as uh, a nation state attack uh, against. I think a foreign adversary. Uh, if he didn't, then I would, <laughs> I would say that. Um, I, I don't th think uh, that you know you can have a cyber war on ransomware or something. I don't know. I would hate to get into that realm. Um, you know, I, I, it, it's a good reminder that like declaring something a war, a war on terrorism, mm. a war on drugs, is often a way to overblow it, to cause overreaction. I honestly, though, think that there has been an underreaction to these cyber attacks, and that they are escalating, and that you know, we need to take them more seriously. Uh, but I'm not asking for a, cyber, for a war on cyber war. Right, <laughs> um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Fine, thanks, good answers. So here's another one. Um, have you seen any indication that companies in the West are more willing to honestly discuss cyber incidents? Uh, well, yesterday's talk by Torsten about um, Norsk Hydro mm -hmm. was, you know, very, it's very refreshing. And when Hydro announced the results of their ransomware attack and began to speak about it, not to me, which I forgive them for, but to... Um, publicly and uh, to, to like the BBC, uh, I thought that was an amazing act of, mm. of courage and uh, hopefully a good sign that we're like maybe getting over at least the victim shaming uh, phase of, of this, com you know, this coming out process that like um, companies will be able to talk about these like hugely traumatic and serious experiences that they go through. Uh, you know, I, I didn't see, I still haven't seen any sign from most NotPetya victims that they're willing to talk about this mm -hmm. publicly. I guess Maersk maybe is doing some talks now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I think the Norsk Hydro is a great example of, of a changing mindset. Yes. That will, I think, will hopefully help us to understand these situations better and respond better and be more prepared for them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, and in my mind, I mean, when you go out and show uh, that you have managed such a crisis that they did, that's a show of strength. It's not a show of weakness. So absolutely. Should, they should absolutely be, be proud of that and what they accomplished. So here's a, a difficult one. Um, what do you think of uh, Kaspersky being represented at this conference, uh, considering them being Ooh. banned for certain reasons? Well, I really appreciate Kaspersky, honestly. Uh, I... I've never myself actually reported on any Kaspersky ties to intelligence agencies. I, I don't know, if, the, if that was confirmed, I would not be surprised, but I also would not be confir you know, surprised that FireEye has ties to American intelligence agencies and CrowdStrike, and that's not, I mean, that's not unusual. 
I, I notice that Kaspersky tends to report uh, pretty frequently on Russian APTs, which is you know pretty impressive and courageous. Uh, when I speak to Kaspersky, even about these subjects, they they go pretty far. Sometimes they stop just you know. Uh, short of attribution to Russia, but so does everybody else. Not everybody else, but many other companies won't do attribution either. Uh, I think Kaspersky absolutely should be at a conference like this. Uh, does Kaspersky have, you know, is there some uh, insidious, like, Russian government connection in some part of Kaspersky? Maybe, but there are lots of amazing researchers there to doing incredible work that they deserve credit for. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you, you can't I mean, pull all over one comb, I guess. So you have pointed at GRU as being the responsible culprit in, in your book. Yeah, um, which and is it's not just me. Like, I, I, you know, if it were just me, I would feel more nervous about that <laughs> attribution. But it's not. It's like uh, all five, five eyes simultaneously calling out to the Russian military. Uh, the Washington Post also tied NotPetya to the GRU. Uh, then the GCHQ, just last year, released this whole list of attacks, including NotPetya and many others that I spoke about, uh, just saying one after another, we, with high confidence, attribute this is almost certainly the, res the responsibility of the GRU. Um, so I, you know, I took that as a, the closest thing to confirmation that we can get. Yeah. But that is uh, kind of the weak spots with attribution. I mean, it's there was the word almost in there. Right. Uh, yeah. That's arguable, I guess. But um, I think we're done here. And some great thanks, or big thanks. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> for, <laughs> Thank for, you. For doing yeah. this interview and answering these questions. Really looking forward to reading your book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.